little bit about me. I'm the Director of Client Services here at Outspoken Media, and I have an MA in Children's Literature. I am a former children's book reviewer for the Hornbook Guide, which is a periodical out of Boston that reviews all of the children's books that come out during a given year. I am also a Maurice Sendak enthusiast and a former child, so I read a lot of books then, too. I'm going to be making a lot of comparisons between children's literature and digital marketing because um, we do digital marketing here, and I have a background in children's literature, but I also think that there are some pretty natural comparisons between the two. So when thinking about children's literature, for instance, children's books and picture books in particular, you have some pretty set standards when it comes to format and length. You're going to be looking at probably about 32 pages, give or take. Um, you're going to have an audience with a short attention span. They might try to chew on the book if it's more of a board book, but hopefully they're engaged. And then you're also going to be thinking about bright colors and really basic, very um, grabby messaging to keep their attention. And when you're thinking about the internet, there are a lot of similarities. Many more pages on the internet, um, but same short attention span with your audience, probably not chewing on the internet, hopefully, but um, they're into cats and strong opinions, and you need those same strong colors and really um, clear messaging to grab their attention. So um, some of this might sound a little bit just kind of like content marketing, which has been you know, the latest in many trends of what um, we as digital marketers kind of grab onto and strangle until there's no life left into it. But I would say that storytelling is something much different than content marketing. It has a much richer background and a longer history. Uh, it is being commandeered by the digital world right now. I'm speaking at PubCon in Las Vegas in October on um, a storytelling panel that is in a storytelling track, an entire day dedicated to storytelling. So there are a lot of people that are talking about it right now, but I think it's important to remember that it's not just the digital marketing angle. There's a lot more to it. And you can see here, this is data pulled from Google Trends, which is really fun, just to get a sense of the relationship between content marketing here, way down on the bottom, and then storytelling way up above. These are overall search volume for the terms over a period of time from 2005 to 2015. So what is story? Um, Rhea was kind of talking a little bit about her favorite story and breaking that third wall, but there are a lot of components to what makes up a story. One way to think about it is it's a two-way interaction. Um, it is that give and take between audience and storyteller. But in 2016, that storyteller, a lot of times, is actually our phone. It's the you know thing that you have in your pocket and you take out when you're waiting at the DMV or the post office or before you go to bed or, or whenever it is that you're looking at it. That's how most people are actually um, getting the story in through their medium. It's, it's their phone. It's not as much books or um, kind of cave talks around the fire as it used to be, but it's really your iPhone or your Android. Um, and there are really three components to think about when thinking about story. There's plot and there's delivery and there's audience. And that interaction between the three is really where the magic happens or doesn't happen, depending on how it's executed. So there are a lot of ways to think about that plot part, that actual like the story crux. One is all great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. And I'm sure some of you have heard this before. There are other ways, too. Um, one is that all stories fall into seven plot categories. Um, and this is uh, Christopher Booker, The Seven Basic Plots. And you'll notice some of these. Uh, I've picked children's literature favorites, but there's some others in there. Overcoming the Monster, Beowulf, Harry Potter, Rags to Riches, Aladdin, Cinderella, Jane Eyre, The Quest, The Iliad, Watership Down, Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle, Voyage and Return, The Odyssey, Alice in Wonderland, Labyrinth, and then comedy, Twelfth Night, anything that's kind of in that romantic comedy genre at what used to be Blockbuster on Netflix is usually in a comedy section. Tragedy, Macbeth, Hamlet, Breaking Bad. Doesn't happen so much in picture books, but um, is still a favorite category. And then Rebirth, Beauty and the Beast, and How the Grinch Stole Christmas. 
Obviously, you don't have to have just one of those categories when you're telling a story. This is an ad, an ad from Nike. It's actually um, a video where uh, it starts kind of much farther out from this young gentleman. He hasn't even crested the hill yet, and he's running, and he's trying so hard, and he just kind of over time gets closer and closer to the camera until uh, find your greatness is the thing that pops up. And this really embodies not just the quest, but the rebirth and a number of different stories. So I think where the magic happens is that overlap between plot and delivery. So um, you can have one of those categories, or you can have a journey, you can have any one of the different narrative components that really makes up what it is that you're trying to convey to your audience. But to make it really good, your delivery has to be genuine, and it has to be fun. So in picture books, uh, delivery is usually in the illustration. This is an illustration pulled from one of my favorite children books, uh, children illustrators, Molly Bang. And it's actually from a book she wrote about illustrating children's books. And it, um, during the book, breaks down how you use the different components and the page and the different uh, light and dark shapes and how you make all of those come together to start putting together a plot without actually having to use any words. Does anyone have any guesses what this plot is? It's a pretty well-known fairy tale. Yeah. And the reason that we know that, um, it's not that she has a, a hood. Um, we can tell it's a wolf, but she's just a tiny triangle. And what's really great, and I suggest that everyone, if you um, are a visual marketer in any way that you take a look at this, I'm sure we have many designers in the room who um, have studied above and beyond, but I really like this book because of its simplicity. She starts with, even be, below, before this, she has little red riding hood down in the corner and she's much bigger and she feels much safer. But then she starts talking about how the little changes make such a big difference. The fact that the wolf's eye was originally the same size and shape as little red riding hood kind of doesn't put you at ease the same way as this darting triangle does on, on this side here. Same thing, when his teeth are black, they kind of blend in with the rest of his head and you're not thinking, oh God, those are menacing. And then adding the tongue that is also the same color associated with Little Red Riding Hood adds another layer where you're kind of thinking about her and the wolf's mouth, and it all gets kind of terrible. And then to add this deep purple color gives it the sense that it's actually twilight and not daytime, which is what you have on the left. And so we're not talking about a lot of design changes um, in a large scale, but those small tweaks take it from being an okay picture to a much more intimidating one where Little Red Riding Hood is very unsafe and she's definitely at the center of the wolf's gaze. And it's all in those small changes, which is all in the delivery. Let's play a, just a quick game because I've got a couple more of these and they're really fun. These are Christina Jackson's Modernist Fairy Tale posters. So any guesses the one on the left? Not very much to it, but it is a pretty common fairy tale. Yep. How about on the right? Oh, Three Little Pigs. Or the, yeah, okay, Three Little Pigs. I always confuse it with one of the other ones. How about on the right? Uh, this is kind of hard to see, but this is actually a red skull right here. And then there's all these little white dots. No, but Pac-Man's an excellent guess. <laughs> this one's kind of hard. This is Hansel and Gretel. Those are the breadcrumbs. Okay, how about on the top? Yep. And on the bottom? Yep. How about on the left? Yeah, quick. And on the right? Yeah. There's not much there, but you guys got pretty much all of those pretty quickly. You don't need a lot of elements when you're telling a really good visual story. The art of storytelling really is in that delivery. And in picture books, a lot of it is that visual component. And I would argue that as digital marketers, really good storytelling has that visual component too because a lot of times that text that you see on your phone is not the thing that's gonna grab you, you need something more. I wanna use one more example to really hammer in the point because I think that it's not just about good illustrations, but it's going about, it's about going above and beyond with the delivery and really trying to find a new and interesting way to bring that visual story to the reader. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with Where the Wild Things Are. Um, very popular children's book. It's one of my favorites, but probably not 
for the same reasons as everyone else. So this um, is pretty early in the story. You have Max here, and he's at home, and he's causing like a medium amount of mischief. He's hammering that into the wall, and he's, I think, just chased the dog with a fork, or maybe he's about to do it. But he's not really terrible and he's contained within the page. There's a large white margin around his illustration. So there's text on the left, which isn't shown here, and then there's Max, and he's being kind of naughty, like middle of the road naughty. But then, as he gets more wild, okay, now he chases the dog. Um, the picture actually expands, and your illustration gets bigger, and the margin starts to shrink. So you'll see that the margin's getting smaller, and then as the wilderness starts to expand in his room, the trees start to grow, and it's not just a bedroom with a bed, but it's actually a forest, you'll see that it gets bigger, and then the trees actually start to expand outside of the frame into that white margin. Until when you get to the very middle pages, you'll see that it actually overtakes the entire margin. So now it's getting really wild. He's going to where the wild things are, and it's actually the entire page that it's taking up, and there is no margin. And the words are pushed farther and farther below. Here you'll see that it's illustration all the way to the top, and then below, just the text kind of pushed down. And then at the most wild, the wild rumpus, there's no text at all. There's just full page illustration all the way out, full bleed, and just absolute wildness in that illustration. And I think it's really great, because it takes that medium and it pushes a little bit further, and it actually uses the page to show you, oh, he's being real wild right now. Like, watch out. He means it. <laughs> and then when he goes home, it starts to shrink. And I think one of the last illustrations is just him with a much smaller um, white box and his, his dinner is waiting for him or something like that. So I think Sendak does a really great job here of invoking that wild feeling in... Um, his readers, for better or worse, because a lot of his readers are toddlers and we don't want them to feel super wild and start chasing the dog with forks and whatnot. But I think it works really well. And I think as digital marketers, we could start to think, how do we want our audiences to feel? Like, what could we do to not just show them a blog post with, a, with an illustration at the top or, or just kind of a, a, a simple article? What more could we do? And I found an example that I really liked. So I've never been on a cruise, because uh, I'm very afraid of the Norwal bears, but um, I know that they're actually very fun. So this is Royal Caribbean, and they have um, this entire subdirectory site where you go, and it says, instant Caribbean vacation, and, and they say, uh, there's a pop-up first, and it says, please put your headphones in. And so you put your headphones in, and all of a sudden, there's the sound of the ocean, and there's waves, and there's breeze and it's lovely, and it asks, do you want to enter or sail away? So you click, and then you're in the ship, and you can actually, um, you can click around the stateroom, and you can look to see at all the different areas, and then as you click in further, you can go outside, and you can look at the water slides, and then when you're here, you can actually like go down the water slide. There's a 360 3D view, and um, it does a pretty good job of giving you like a tiny vacation at your desk where you're like, ooh, water slide. And then, um, you know, it goes away real quick. But I would say that this succeeds. This makes you feel the way that Royal Caribbean wants you to feel. You're excited. You are perhaps a little more relaxed. And you're actually thinking about the possibility of going on a cruise and what that would be like with or without the Norwell virus. But... Story will help you carry your brand when you have limited reach, even on the platforms you've come to rely on. There's a lot more we can say about where search is right now, which is a big part of what we do, and how um, your space on Google is limited and your time in front of your audience on platforms like Facebook is limited, especially if they've turned off notifications. And you're kind of competing with a lot of different areas to get your brand and story in front of your audience. But I think that using story to build content strategy has a lot of potential to help you get your audience to remember you, even if they only see you for that one you know, water slide or that one um, quick advertisement that's going to grab their attention. So when you're thinking about building content strategy and using story, there are four different areas that I see as being essential. You need to do your research. You need to think about format authenticity, and community. So let's talk first about research 
And we're going to go a little SEO for a minute, so I hope that there's at least a portion of the audience that's excited about this. Because for us, one of the big things, good, okay, good, good. Because um, one of the things that we do is um, technical SEO and keyword research, gap analysis for our clients, and we try to help them figure out what people are searching for that's going to help them find their spot online. So we are missing the boat a lot though, when it comes to keyword research because um, there are a lot of ways where it can go wrong. Incomplete keyword research is to blame. And I think that there are a couple ways that you can avoid that, and we'll kind of talk through them. How do you search for something when you really don't understand it? Um, this is one of the biggest problems I think we come up against as SEOs, is that you can find keywords that you think that your brand should rank for, whatever it happens to be that they are, um, but they might not actually be what's happening on the other side of that computer when somebody is looking for cruises or whatever it is that they want. Uh, I have a couple examples, and we'll talk through them quickly. This is from a client of ours. What if you didn't already know the difference between the two when thinking about LED and, and CFL bulbs? This was a piece that we wrote for an energy provider, and not a particularly sexy industry. I would much rather be working with cruise lines that we could like, make lovely videos for, but we need to help them. And we're finding that one of the ways that we can do this is by building informational content that people are searching for. And people don't necessarily know the difference between CFL and LED bulbs. So they might search LED versus CFL, or if they're like a step further and way in the dark, they might also search for curly versus straight, <clears throat> because that's kind of the differentiating visual component between the two. One is a spiral and one is straight. So we found this when we were doing keyword research. And we optimized the piece. We added keywords not just for LED versus CFL, but also for curly versus straight, because that's what the audience was searching for. And this is data pulled from Search Console. The original piece was optimized for about eight keywords, but because we hit all of those different modifiers, and we were not just focusing on what we thought that they were searching for, but what they might also be searching for, over time, we found that it now ranks for 210, which is a much, much wider range of keywords. And that's a pretty big success for the client. And all that we did was think a little more broad about what somebody might be searching for. Another good example, oh, I guess to help your audience find the content they are looking for, first, focus on selling later. Uh, I think that's just one of the arch overarching trends with that piece is thinking about what they're searching for, not what you want them to buy. Um, so what if you want to grow your audience and you aren't sure how? This is another client of ours, and they are a science publication, and um, they are looking to bring in new readers, but they don't necessarily know how to grab them. So what we need to find when we're looking at those keywords is all possible queries, not just what they think those people are going to be looking for. So here are two examples of two searches that are bringing up pretty similar results. On the left, study of fossils. On the right, paleontology. And they're both pretty informational, and they both have an answer box on the top that brings in some information on paleontology, or I think there's a definition on the right. Um, but when you actually take a look, a lot of the search results are pretty similar, even though this one on the left really doesn't have an understanding of the terminology, it still brings up that paleontology kind of search result where we do want the client to be ranking for it. So even though it's not a scientific term, we do want to make sure that that page that they're trying to get to rank also has study of fossils in there for the people that are not yet readers and are not yet at the level where they fully understand what it is that they're searching for. So what does this mean for keyword research? We need to go broader, deeper, further, and longer. We need to go broader. We need to make sure that we're pulling in not just direct competitors when you're looking at research for keywords or or just in general, but also informational sites. So when we're looking at doing research for our energy client, we're not just going to look at other competitors. We're going to make sure that we also look at um, informational sites like EPA.gov. We're also going to go deeper. We're going to make sure that we, um, we use Moz Keyword Explorer, that we're looking at autocomplete, because autocomplete is a really fantastic way to see what the world is searching for, good or bad. Um, it'll tell you what's going to come up after a branded query or, you know, you put in um, 
paleontology, and you may find that there are additional queries that are kind of related to that. And we're also going to use trial and error, error to get a better sense of what keywords are going to work. This is the Moz Keyword Explorer. Has anyone in the room used this tool? It's really great. Um, it's, they recently introduced uh, this newest version of it, and it will not just give you data on the keywords that you're looking for, it'll also give you suggestions for other keywords, which is really fantastic. And here, I think we put in um, paleontology, and you'll see that how does a paleontologist define a species is a keyword that pops up, and that might really be a great blog post for our client. So don't be scared of low or search volume. Longer tailed keywords in specialized fields are going to have that kind of low search volume keyword because you're thinking about something that's very specialized and very um, niche market at that point. Go further. You also have to check your SERPs and your competitors to make sure it's the neighborhood you want to be in. This I can't emphasize enough. Um, we always make sure, here is the LED, or a query that we could have considered for the LED versus CFL bulbs. This is just LED lights. Um, and it is relevant, because it is about LED lights, but these are all sites that are selling LED light bulbs. Um, and this is really very transactional, and not necessarily some place that we want our client to rank, because they don't sell light bulbs, they sell energy. So we want to make sure that they're in a neighborhood that makes sense for them. LED versus CFL, for instance, here, We've got um, Forbes, an article on which is the best. We have something from the Simple Dollar. These are all really relevant informational um, articles that we would like our client to be in the neighborhood of. But we also take it a step further. We actually look at the articles and see what they have to offer and what we might be able to offer that's better, but also just to make sure it's in the right neighborhood. So take it even a step further. And then go longer. Monitor Search Console for relevant modifiers and other keywords you will inevitably rank for over time. Just because you've published something doesn't mean that it's done and you can't go back to it and um, consider it, consider modifying it, or consider doing an add-on somewhere down the road if you find that you're actually starting to rank for something you hadn't even considered. But be careful with how you select titles and tell your story. This is that same client. Um, this, they really had no sense of search before we started working with them. And they're writing like research scientists. They are getting that information out there. And this particular piece is on giant balls of bacteria piling up on the Arctic lake beds and oozing toxins. I'm sure that title is perfectly descriptive of exactly what that piece of research is about. But this client is now ranking for giant balls and giant ball sack. But they're a science periodical. This is probably not what they were looking for. <laughs> yeah, a new opportunity. So one of the things that we're doing with them is helping them make sure they're choosing the really important parts of the page that are well optimized for the keywords that they actually want to rank for. Format, we'll go through these quickly. Um, this is an article on content lead, just saying that the longer that a, a publisher is working with content, the more varied and the more diverse their content types start to be, the more video, the more illustration. Just keep that in mind when thinking about what you could write. A more mature audience kind of has, or a more mature um, publisher has that type of content. And don't forget to think, how do I want my audience to feel? This, um, this piece on the left is something we did for a client way back. They were an um, e-commerce platform, and they wanted to start building up a following and um, interest in their new entertaining, or entertaining line. So we created a number of pieces that were focused on glassware and um, entertaining and barware and drinking and all of those different components. And here you have a Mai Tai visual recipe, and on the right you have just a plain written out recipe. And I would argue, if you really want to get your audience excited about the possibility of drinking a Mai Tai, left does a much better job than right. Same thing here. You can do it on a small scale, and you can do it on a large scale. Same client. Um, this is for the same line. This is anatomy of a perfect bar cart. And we did this illustration for them, knowing that they had all of these different kinds of um, barware that they wanted to be selling. And that if we told the story of how you should stock your bar, and didn't just list it out, but gave them a lovely visual, then that would be something that people would share and pass along. And this thing just, Pinterest ate it up. 
really loved it. Um, I think it was pinned tens of thousands of times, and there were many backlinks to it. Um, and it's a shame that the site isn't around anymore because they got some good work out of this. But on a larger scale, there are even more possibilities. This is um, Iceland Air has this subdomain where you can go, and they've built out an entire little um, experience around the Northern Lights. And when you click in, you can create your own aurora where you play. It gives you this whole education of like how the pH balance in the atmosphere is actually the piece that changes the colors. And you can play with them and make it change one way or a direction. Or you can see the history of the lights. And I think you can actually even see like a 10-day forecast if you're going there to find out whether or not you're actually going to get to see the northern lights. This is really exciting uh, for me in particular because I'm going to Iceland on Thursday. I will not get to see the northern lights, though, because I did some really poor planning. But um, if I were going later in the year, I could use this. And um, it does a really great job of providing the information and telling the story. So I'm sure that that cost them a tremendous amount of money, but that one piece is much better than 15 blog posts that are doing a much lesser job of capturing the audience and telling the story. Authenticity is another one. So um, if you stay in your sphere of knowledge and relevancy, tap into how people are using your product. And there are um, you can branch out in a certain number of ways, but uh, one of the, the examples that we like, um, we have a lot of glasses in our office, is Warby Parker. They have a blog where they um, are supporting things like wear your sunglasses at work day, which makes sense because it is a classes company, but then they do start to branch out a little bit more and they start to talk about things like summer reading. And they make all of these really fun flow charts that are kind of tongue in cheek and talk about what you might be reading if you're in a certain mood and they're just fun and they're still relevant because it is that reading component, but they're having fun with it. And there's a lot you can do with your community too. Don't be scared of your audience. Don't forget that that third part, after you have your plot and your delivery, is the person that you're actually telling your story to. Gather your audience's stories on your own properties or on theirs. So uh, ModCloth does a really great job of this. Do we have any ModCloth shoppers? Yeah. They do a fantastic job of not just selling their clothes, but saying, hey, you bought this. Why don't you show us how it looks on you and leave your measurements so other people know, but also you leave a review. And you can actually start to get a sense of um, other people's style and take a look at how their pieces are being styled on real people, which is fantastic. Or you can invite them to share um, on their own properties, too. So uh, here is a blogger who went on a cruise. This is O oh Dare Dre, which I think is like a natural foods blog, and she went on a carnival cruise and um, did this whole write-up about what a great time she had. I'm sure it was a sponsored post. It had the little note under it. It was all done in the up and up. But this is really great promo for getting an audience that might not be excited about Carnival, excited about them by reading about the experience that she had. The more you interact with your audience, the richer your story will become. And I think that's my last slide. <laughs>